If you're not caffeinated, that's the thing. You're in trouble. Okay. So we're stressed. Okay. We need to get serious. Um, <laughs> All right, here we go. So we are streaming live on YouTube on the SSP um, YouTube channel. And I wanna welcome everyone to our guest speaker today, Dr. Eric Cornell. And our team one from CUB is going to do the introduction. So we are ready for them to start our introduction, please. Wow, darky glasses. Hello, everyone. We are CUB Team 1, and we are grateful for having the opportunity of introducing Dr. Eric Cornell. Dr. Eric Cornell was born in Palo Alto, California in 1961, and two years later, he moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts, where his father was a professor of civil engineering at MIT. After high school, he enrolled at Stanford University, where he studied physics and took part in various low temperature physics groups on campus. He graduated with honors and distinction in 1985. For graduate school, he went to MIT, where he joined Dr. David Pritchard's group, which had a running experiment that tried to measure the mass of the electron neutrino from the beta decay of tritium. And Dr. Cornell obtained his PhD in 1990 from MIT. How cool is that? Uh, here's a little fun fact. Uh, Dr. Cornell's father used to help him calculate the, uh, calculate the center of mass of rockets that he designed. And his father even challenged him with uh, physics brain teasers in lieu of uh, bedtime stories. After obtaining his doctorate, he joined Carl Weinman at the University of Colorado Boulder as a postdoctoral researcher on a small laser cooling experiment. During his two years as a postdoc, he came up with a plan to combine laser cooling and evaporative cooling in a magnetic trap to create a Bose-Einstein condensate. And through his work at the Joint Institute for Laboratory Astrophysics, Dr. Cornell, along with Dr. Wolfgang Ketterle and Dr. Carl Weinman, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 2001 for the achievement and study of the properties of Bose-Einstein condensation and dilute gases of alkali atoms. Other notable achievements include that Dr. Cornell was awarded the Lorentz Medal in 1998. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and he was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2005. Dr. Eric Cornell is currently a professor at the University of Colorado Boulder and a physicist at the United States Department of Commerce National Institutes of Standards and Technology. His lab is located at the Joint Institute for Lab Laboratory Astrophysics. His research includes the Bose-Einstein condensate, other ultra-cold physics and electricity, and the electric dipole moment. Please join us in welcoming Dr. Cornell. Should I share my screen now? Yes, please. Let's see if this works. Okay. I move this little thing around. This thing is sort of getting in my way. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about looking for fossils of the Big Bang in the laboratory, which I really mean making very precise measurements to learn more about, about physics and, and astrophysics. Can people hear me okay? Am I loud enough? Okay. But I'm going to take the story back a little ways, and I know that a lot of you are in astrophysics summer camp, so this won't be a totally new story to you. But uh, right about 14 years before this lecture, there was, uh, well, there was no really better way to describe it than a bang. And, uh, and as the uh, creation hymn goes, the whole universe was in a hot dead state um, and uh, was filled with many, many more particles than there are in the universe now. Electrons, protons, neutrons, sure, but also anti-electrons, anti-protons, anti-neutrons in an immense, in a very, very dense and hot plasma. Then uh, the universe started to expand, and like a lot of things, like whenever gas expands, gas is, you know, the ideal gas law, you take the gas, you expand it, and things get colder. 
same thing applied to the universe has started to cool down. You can tell the universe is expanding because it's getting bigger, and you can tell it's cooling because it goes from red to blue, which is sort of a colder color. And then what started to happen is um, bit by bit, something very romantic happened. Um, the the um, each proton found an antiproton, and each electron found an antielectron, and neutron and antineutron, so on, and they stuck together. Uh, each particle found its uh, true soul mate, and uh, these these joinings together were sort of passionate, but sort of short-lived. So the electron, the anti-electron, would annihilate each other, poof, and protons and antiprotons pop, and all that was left would be photons. These these solid material particles, like protons and electrons and neutrinos, they would meet their antiparticle and then bang. And this was happening all around the universe just a very short time after the Big Bang. But if you look very carefully, and I don't know if you, if you can see my cursor here, but every every here and there you can every here and there you can see like an electron, here's a proton, here's a neutron that somehow did not match up. <laughs> so you might say that there was somebody there was somebody for everyone except for a very few people or very few particles left over. So uh, the question is, who are these lonely particles that nobody wanted? And the answer is, uh, yeah, they're you. That's what the universe these days and all of us are made of is the very, very small number, like one part per billion of the electrons that didn't find an anti-electron. The only reason why we're around at all is that right at the beginning of the early age of the, of the universe, there was slightly, slightly, slightly more matter than antimatter. If this sort of symmetry, the sort of perfect matching of matter and antimatter across the universe had been more perfect, there'd be nothing left. And the universe would be a very boring place, just a big empty space full of photons, yawn, right? But as it turns out, we have all these interesting things, planets and galaxies and, and human beings and, and true love. So it's good. Uh, and it's important uh, that what was nearly perfect was not exactly perfect. So there's this imperfection at the beginning of the universe. And uh, not to get all religious, but we were born of this original imperfection. Uh, this is the doctrine of original imperfection you heard the 18th century preachers talking about. Uh, so how can we learn more about this? Uh, you know, there, there, are, there aren't time machines. Uh, there are no uh, recordings. There's no papyri in which the, the, the scribes of that age wrote about this 14 billion years ago. How can we learn and come to understand more about this Mabel's single most important imperfection that ever happened, the thing that allowed the universe to, to evolve into what we are now. And I sort of think of this as there's really sort of three different ways of looking back and understanding the very early universe and, and the particles that were there and, and how they came to, to, to evolve. And one of them is telescopes and related things. Uh, this is a telescope for photons. It's actually a concept of a, of a new telescope. Gravity waves <coughs> um, detectors I include as under the rubric of telescopes, they're basically looking at gravity waves as they come in. So I'll call that a telescope. And these uh, similarly, there's these neutrino tanks that detect neutrinos being emitted in the sun and further away. And also, I, I think of this in the world, basically as part of the world of telescopes. You can use a telescope for looking back in time. When you see a galaxy uh, that's 10 million light years away, you don't see it the way it is now. You see it the way it was 10 million years ago. Uh, the farthest thing away that we've ever seen, galaxy GNZ11, is 13.3 billion years ago. Remember, the whole universe is only 14 billion years old. So when we see that galaxy, we are seeing, we're seeing the universe as it was when it was only 4% as it is old today. So we're looking back almost all the way to the Big Bang, but not far enough back. In the sense that by the time there were galaxies forming, this weird imperfection where the electrons weren't exactly balanced by the anti-electrons, that had already happened. So that's not good enough for this question. Another way of looking back in time is doing simulations. What if we were to use a, a modern day machine to simulate, to create an environment which was kind of like the Big Bang? And that's really the idea between, behind these super colliders where they take protons and antiprotons and smash them together at phenomenally high energy. And they make briefly a sort of plasma of, of, of you know, particles and antiparticles in a little dense ball, and then they fly apart and are detected in this detector here, you, which you see a picture of. It's an enormous machine. Um, it's uh, many kilometers across. Uh, this, is, this is a track underground, sort of going back and forth. The, the particles go around, they go back and forth between Switzerland and, and France. Here is the detector they use for like seeing all these particles, and for scale, there's a person right there. 
it's maybe the largest scientific instrument that was ever built. And yet um, it's really, uh, these days, um, this is not widely appreciated, but the Large Hadron Collider is perceived to be something of a disappointment by the experts. It wasn't able to answer these, this question I posed and other related questions about particle physics and, and cosmology. So um, it discovered the Higgs boson, but everyone knew that was going to be discovered basically. So this basically didn't work. And one day they might build a bigger one, but maybe not. This one already cost $10 billion and 20 years to build. They haven't started the new one. It will cost a lot more than $10 billion, maybe maybe $100 billion, and it might take 30 years, which is to say you might start as a, a career as a physicist more or less now and, and, and retire before this next machine is built. So that whole way of looking back and understanding new particles is between just us, and there's not very many of us here. I just see four in this window, so I'm sure we can all keep a secret kind of dying, that area of physics. So. Don't tell the particles, this is not pretty much what's going on. So what else can you do? Um, how else can you look at it? And my, uh, what I do is I look for fossils. You want to understand what happened to the dinosaurs? You look for their bones uh, and you learn things about the dinosaurs from the, these fossils. So what were the fossils of the Big Bang? Uh, and what we're looking for is, is a reason, sort of fossils of this original asymmetry. Symmetries are super important in physics. Here's a beautifully symmetric snowflake but this is sort of a, a snowflake's a large thing. It's sort of a macroscopic symmetry. And I'm talking about microscopic symmetries at the, at the basic level of, in, of the interactions between fundamental particles like electrons. And one of them is that electrons act just like anti-electrons. Well, we know that's not quite right, right? Because there turned out to be a little bit more electrons than, elect than there were. And there were a little bit more electrons than anti-electrons at the time of the Big Bang. But it's, it's pretty good symmetry. Another one is that particles tend to look exactly the same when you look at, in the mirror. If you look at a person in the mirror, oftentimes, or if you look at yourself in the mirror, you may not be able to tell if you're looking at a, a yourself in the mirror or yourself in a photograph. I can always tell. If I see a photograph of me, I'm missing uh, a left arm. If I look at myself in the mirror, I'm, I'm missing a right arm. So I'm a distinctly anti-symmetric person. I don't have this particular symmetry where thing, things look the same in the mirror. Perhaps it's a coincidence, perhaps not. But in 2004, right around the time that I got into this business, that's when I acquired this profound asymmetry. So maybe this was sparked my interest in asymmetries, I don't know. The other is that time runs more or less the same forward and backward, when the same, not at the macroscopic level. At the macroscopic level, if you drop an egg, the egg smashes, you run that movie backwards, you can tell whether the egg the movie is going forward or backward. But at the microscopic level, like say an electron bounces off of a proton, uh, and you run that movie backwards, you wouldn't be able to tell from looking at the movie whether the movie is running forward or backward. This is called time reversal. All of these symmetries are pretty good, but not perfect. And, 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 and the violation of these, of these symmetries uh, happened uh, a long time ago. And our, our main prejudice is that whatever it was that this violation of symmetry that allowed there to be slightly more protons and antiprotons and caused the universe to come into exist, our, our hope is that the bones of this don't vanish, you know, that they'll stay forever and we can see in modern day particles echoes of this original asymmetry. Um, and so that's really what we're about. Uh, so far, when we look at modern day particles, they're pretty symmetric and they don't, they don't possess enough asymmetry to explain the Big Bang asymmetry, the matter-antimatter asymmetry. So we're looking for new forms of asymmetry in modern particles. And so we're in particular looking at the sort of maybe the simplest and best understood of all the particles, the electron. And uh, I have to let you, electrons aren't actually gendered particles, but you know, this is just sort of a friendly way calling it Mr. Electron. It's got a charge, a monopole, a mass, it spins. And because it's charged and it spins, it has a magnetic dipole, you know, moving, moving electric currents or like currents going around a wire. So it's got a, it's got a it generate some magnetic field. This is the electron. And uh, <clears throat> the question is, is the North pole of the, of this magnetic dipole and the South pole, are they exactly the same? Is it symmetric in that respect? Here's a place where it is not true. If you look at the earth, the earth also is a spinning thing and it's got a North pole and a South pole. The North Pole and the South Pole are entirely different. Uh, the South Pole is a continent. There's huge mountains. Um, it's like there's, there's actually land there. The North Pole, that's the South Pole. The North Pole is just sea ice. It's basically just an ocean there that's frozen. In the, in the North, there's polar bears. In the South, there's penguins. 
These are very asymmetric animals. I mean, well, I'm not saying a polar bear is asymmetric. I'm just saying that no one would mistake a polar bear for a penguin if you saw the penguin in a mirror, if you know what I'm saying. They're very quite distinct. And um, so the Earth is clearly very, very different. But the electron is near as anyone has ever been able to tell. The North Pole and the South Pole are exactly the same. It's possible, and this is kind of the hypothesis we want to test, that there's a little, you know, it's mostly, electron is mostly negative, but there might be a little bit of positive charge due to the North Pole and a little negative charge the South Pole, such that it's still mostly just one unit of electricity, but that it has an electric dipole moment. If you, you can sort of think of adding this little bit of elect, uh, negative to that, and this positive cancels a little bit. So electric dipole moment kind of looks as if the center of the charge of the electron is not exactly in the same place as the center of its mass. And we try and measure these things, and we find out that they are really very darn close to each other. Um, even as of, 1920, uh, to, uh, as of 2005, people had said, well, if these two things are different, if there's an electric dipole moment, that the center of mass and center of charge are different, it's less that it's less than 10 to the minus 27 centimeters, which is a, a fabulously small distance. To put it in perspective, uh, you know, if you shrunk the Earth to the size of, a, sorry, if you took an electron and you expanded it to the size of the Earth, saying there's this small, the offset is less than 10 to the minus 27 centimeters, it sort of said it's equivalent to saying the Earth has a a little extra thickness on one end, you know, and if they're on one pole, it's thought of the other pole and it's less than like the thickness of a layer of viruses or something, something astonishingly small compared to the thickness of the Earth. So the electron is small, but its electric dipole moment is even smaller yet by much, much, much less, uh, by about 14 orders of magnitude. So our experiment is to do better, to take that limit of 10 to the minus 27. The theorists keep saying, we know there was a big bang. We know there was a, and asymmetry from the protons and the antiprotons. We know that asymmetry has to somehow live today in modern particles. There's got to be a fossil of it. Why don't you, Eric, and, and people like you, why don't you go and look harder at the electron? Because we really think if you were to look harder and make a more accurate measurement, maybe one that was sensitive to 10 to the minus 28 or 10 to the minus 29, we think you would see this electric dipole moment and it would make us very happy. And what for do we exist really except to make our fellow human beings happy? And so that was a strong enough motivation for us. Or if you're something of a more grumpy frame of mind, you could say, well, we'll measure it and we won't see this asymmetry and that will disprove their theory. And that's sort of a more destructive way of looking at it. Well, one way or the other, it would be exciting for us whether we see it or we don't see it. So this is an experiment which is going on at JILA, which is here on the University of Colorado Boulder campus, where I understand that you aren't, but you would be if they weren't for, for COVID. Uh, the experiment has gone on for now for many years and we're getting more and more accurate. And over the years, many, many graduate students have participated in undergraduates, postdocs, but uh, year in and year out, I do this experiment jointly with my pal Jun Yi. Here's a picture of Jun Yi. He's also a, a professor of physics and we've worked together for many years. His students tell me that, that Jun Yi dislikes this picture of him looking so dreamy here on top of the laser. So I always manage to include it in my slides, sort of, to, I don't know, to get him a little bit. <laughs> and uh, this, these experiments have been funded by private foundations and also the federal government. Here's a picture of uh, some of the students past and present uh, around the outside DC students who are uh, recently arrived or recently gone. Uh, Kong Quen is now a professor at, uh, recently got tenure at Harvard and um, uh, Will just joined a quantum computing company and Laura runs her own research lab here at NIST at, the, at the, the big federal labs here in Boulder. So they're all, you know, gone off and done interesting things like the stuff that they learned. Uh, all right, so here's how we do it. And I'm gonna do it by way of teaching you some interesting rules of experimental physics where I hope you find it interesting. If you want to measure something very, very precisely, you want to change that, that thing you want to measure into a frequency and measure that. Anytime anybody tells you a number in, in physics or chemistry, which has more than about four digits, chances are the way they measured it is they converted that thing into a frequency and measured the frequency. What do I mean by converting it into a frequency? Well, let's suppose we want to measure uh, gravity. Inside a, a clock, there's a pendulum. The pendulum swings to one side. Why does it swing back? It's, it swings back because gravity tugs on it. Gravity isn't tugging on it directly back, but if it's tugging this way, there's a component of gravity which is tugging along the length of the pendulum. You can, and a component of the same vector of gravity which is pulling it that way. So gravity pulls it back 
It swings too far, gravity pulls it back again. And it's a very good way of measuring gravity. It's one of the best ways of measuring gravity is by measuring the frequency of a pendulum. And here's an example of turning uh, a, a, a quantity, in this case, the strength of gravity into a frequency, stronger gravity, faster pendulum. Um, people are able, physicists are able to measure small changes in the frequency of clocks to, uh, this, is, this is actually kind of an old slide I'm showing here is 10 to the minus 15. They're closer to 10 to the minus 18 now. So in principle, if gravity were to change by a very small amount, this pendulum, this grandfather clock, and I should tell you that these are not the clocks that are good to part 10 to, 10 to the 18, but the clocks uh, that are good to 10 to the 18, you know, if the physics that's making that clock wiggle and oscillate and, and count out the seconds of those physics should change a little bit, then the clock frequency will change too. So it's a great way to measure things super precisely. So for instance, instead of measuring gravity, we could measure how strong there's a magnet. The earth is a magnet and compasses are also magnets and compasses have a, a magnet that can spin around. Um, if you were to put a, a compass in between two strong magnets and you wanted to ask how strong is the strong magnet that my compass is leaning is, is, is inside, I could tilt my compass one way and the South Pole would get pulled down to the North Pole and it would go too far, it would wiggle back and forth. And if we measured the frequency of that little uh, compass wobbling back and forth, we took it, we pulled it out, it would go wah, 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 wah. And if we, if we measure that frequency, that frequency would be, tell us the faster the frequency, the stronger this big magnet it's living in. This is how magnetic resonance imaging work. Uh, inside you, you have hydrogen atoms. Hydrogen atoms are like little, little magnets. They, there's a North Pole and a South Pole to every hydrogen atom. And they put you, they put you say this is you, and, and inside you, you have all these uh, protons, which are part of the water inside you, and they're all magnets, and they put you inside a bigger magnet, and then they have radio in as they pick up the wobbling that of, the, of the protons inside you, and they measure these frequencies in a, in a spatially selective way and reassemble this back into an image of your insides. And they're just doing that by basically measuring the proton, uh, which is like a little north and south pole inside you, or many north and south poles inside you. Of course, we don't care about the magnetic part of the proton. We care about the electric part of the electron. So suppose that our electron had, uh, in addition to a magnetic part, it had like a little bit of electric, a little electricity on the North Pole, a little negative and a little positive on the South Pole. And we put them not just inside a magnet, but inside a magnet which had some, some electric charge coded on it. So this electron, the, elect the North Pole of the electron would be attracted up here. And if that were the case, um, the frequency at which this electron wiggles back and forth, much as the proton wiggles back and forth, the electron wiggles back and forth in the presence of a magnetic field. It's called electron spin resonance instead of nuclear magnetic resonance. It would wiggle back and forth and, and it would change depending on whether or not we were applying an electric field or if we were applying the electric field in the same direction as the magnetic field or the opposite direction. But to make a sensitive measurement, we know the electric dipole moment of the electron if it exists at all, it's really small. So if we want to see it, we have to apply a whopping big electric field, and there's a problem there. One big problem is if you try to apply a really big electric field in a lab, you just get sparks, like the electrons fly off of the negative. You have like two metal plates, and you connect one to a high voltage negative and one to a high voltage positive, sparks fly, which is not useful. And the other thing, which is even more fundamental, is that if you put your electron, if you put your electron in a big electric field, what's going to happen? it's gonna get pulled by the electric field and, and fly over there and stick. That was really good, we're gonna see this again. This is really the extreme limit of my, of my uh, PowerPoint capability. So I want you to ideally go ooh or ah. Hang on, ready, here we go. Wow. Yep, that's animation in, in, in PowerPoint for you. I'm not hearing the ooh and ah, and I assume that's just because you're, you're muted, that's all right. Thank you, I saw ooh. Nicely done, okay, Justin, props, all right. So, uh, so where in, if we want to have a really big electric field, where can we find a really big electric field? Well, one place where electric fields live uh, and are very, very large, larger than you can get between two plates, is inside molecules. If you took some chemistry, you know that sodium chloride, the sodium's positive, it's salt, right? And the sodium is positive and the chlorine is negative. You can imagine, because the sodium and chlorine are very close to each other, there's a very large electric field there. And if we could somehow put our electron right in between the sodium and chlorine, it would be experiencing a huge electric field. Okay. It turns out in a sodium chloride, it's got an even total number of electrons. All the electron spins are all paired up. We use, as it turns out, hafnium fluoride plus hafnium because it's 
a very heavy uh, metal and fluorine because it's very negative. And so that it gives you a very, uh, very strong electric field inside there. And there's some electron, the electron that's living inside the hafnium fluoride plus molecule uh, experiences that electric field. So we need a big electric field. What else do we need? Well, if we want to compare the frequencies, we want to come see whether the, the wiggle of the electron, you know, wobbling in some magnetic field, does it depend on whether the electric field is going one way or the other? We measure frequency really well. And this is another major rule of physics. If you want to measure a frequency really well, you want to measure it for a long time. Here we have two different grandfather clocks. And we want to know which one is faster and which one is slower. So uh, what we do is, well, this, we, well, we have a stopwatch and we, we count it for one minute and we see that grandfather clock number one here uh, uh, ticks for you know, 60 times in one minute. And so does grandfather clock number two. Well, 60 is the same as 60, that's not helping. We could count for an hour and one ticks for 3,600 times, so does the other, can't, still can't help. If we were to count for a whole day, we might find that one grandfather clock ticked about 86,000 times. And finally, we were counting long enough that we noticed that the other one counted 86,403, one more tick. So if we want to compare these frequencies really well, we want to be able to, in essence, count the ticks for a long time. And this is a general principle in, in physics. If you want to measure a frequency really well, you want to be able to look at it for a long time. We've got our molecule and the electrons inside the molecule, and we want to see the molecule ticking. We had to watch them for a long time. So we need to put the molecule in an ion trap. This is a trap for, um, for rabbits, um, but we can also make trap for ions. Instead of using a uh, metal grid, we use these, we use uh, rods of metal, which we put charges on and oscillate in such a way that our, our molecule, which is also charged, is confined along sort of a line between these four rods called an ion trap. Here's a picture of our ion trap. Uh, you can, it's hard to see because it's all coated with gold. Um, it turned out that the gold coating was like this, my bright idea. I thought the gold coating was going to make it work much better. It didn't, but it does make it look really good, especially against this blue background here. Imagine this is like lapis lazuli or something. Um, so it's a very nicely, very beautiful uh, ion trap. The gold was a stupid idea, but it's not the only stupid idea I've ever had. So there's that. And inside there, indeed, we can watch the electrons tick back and forth. And we watch them tick up and down. And they're ticking quite slowly. If you look at this, this is a millisecond. So from here to here is about a second. And there's a very small magnetic field. So if you count it, there's about, works out to about 17, 16, 17 wiggles of it's ticking up and down. We don't count every single tick. We sort of tick, we count these and we extrapolate and we count these and we, we figure out what sine wave nicely connects all of these wiggles. And we see what frequency best fits that, and that's the frequency at which these, these uh, electron is wiggling. Um, how do we listen to an electron tick? It doesn't actually go tick. A grandfather clock goes tick as the pendulum swings back and forth, tick, and then sometimes talk. But an electron doesn't. So we use lasers. Um, I don't, I'm not going to be able to discuss this in great detail or any detail, but the way I, I'm going to. Um, I can tell you this story about particle physics. I can tell you the story about the Big Bang. The truth of the matter is, is that I'm a precision spectroscopist. My, my actual day job is I measure things like atoms and molecules very precisely using lasers. And so most of uh, what my students spend their time doing is using these lasers. And there are actually 10 different lasers in this picture and shining them. You can barely see it, but in the far back here, there's a little steel chamber with an excellent vacuum and the molecules are trapped inside there. And we use the very carefully controlled photons, the chunks of light coming out of the lasers to control the molecules and set them to ticking and use them to understand what ticking is going on. Um, this is just to give you a sense that the molecule we use, hafnium fluoride, you can't buy it from a chemical company. It's a totally unstable molecule. It can only live in a vacuum. So we actually have to make it in the middle of a very good vacuum. We start with some uh, metallic hafnium, we actually melt and, and vaporize the, the, the hafnium with a, a very bright laser beam. The hafnium vapor mixes with some other chemicals, in our case, sulfur hexafluoride, and the, the hafnium strips one of the fluorine atoms off of the sulfur hexafluoride. <coughs> hafnium fluoride atoms float along about a meter 
And when they get into the region right between all the electrodes of our ion trap, we hit it with a laser, knock off an electron, and now it becomes a molecular ion that's trapped there. We do these, we prepare its initial state, we set the thing to ticking, we, we listen to the tick and record it, and we do this again and again. Uh, I'm not gonna explain how it goes because that would be like hours, but it's what we actually do. Um, and then we measure these frequencies. Um, we do it twice. Once we listen to it ticking, once we align up the molecule this way and measure the frequency, and the second time we line up the molecule the other way. So we're changing the sign of the electric field that the electron experiences, and we see if there's a change in the, in the ticking frequency of the electron. Um, we spend most of our time trying to, not just measuring it, but trying to figure out if we're measuring it correctly. So for instance, instead of keeping the ions exactly in the middle of the trap, we'll move the ions from one side of the trap to the other. This is just measured in millimeters, whether they're exactly at the center of the trap or these different colors corresponds to moving it up and down in, in the axial direction along the trap. And, and the various frequencies that we measure change. If our ion trap was <coughs> absolutely perfect, exactly the way we wanted to, these three lines would all be straight and exactly on top of each other, but they're not. And what that tells us is that we've built an imperfect ion trap as everything is imperfect. And we learn how to correct for these imperfections. We know, you know why these things are curved. We understand why they come together in a region which is not exactly at zero, but offset a little from zero. We know why these lines don't completely touch each other. So we learn a great deal about the, the we spend a lot of time studying the apparatus for using the study of the molecule. In some sense, using the molecule to study the apparatus is the same time as we're using the apparatus to study the molecule and try to make sure that we get the answer right. When you're making a, a precision measurement, especially if you're making an important precision measurement, like if we were to measure the electric dipole non-zero, I, I, it's probably back to Stockholm for me, it would be a big deal. Like it would be like a huge result um, and, and that would be cool, but it could also be wrong, right? And so you have, you're doing experiments and oftentimes you're motivated to see this result and it's easy to fool yourself. And since we really don't want to fool ourselves, we have told when we, we, may, we make all these measurements and the computers combine, combine all the data together and give us sort of an average value. And each one of these little dots here is about 10 minutes worth of data. And you can see if we were to take the average of all of these dots, it would come up to an average which was distinctly not zero. This line is zero. And you might think, oh my goodness, that's the, that's the difference in the frequencies. That's the electric dipole moment, except it's not. We instructed the computer that's analyzing the data for us to lie to us. We told the computer, after you've done combining all the data, add a random number and don't tell us what the random number is. And so all we really care about is, are these points you know, all more or less equal to each other? And when we decide that, yeah, our data is looking really good, it's really quiet, that it constantly averages, no matter what we do, it always averages to the same number. We don't know if that, this number here is zero or not, because the computer won't tell us what the random number is, but that's good. We, instead of like deciding whether our data is good or bad, depending on whether it's telling us what we want to hear, we decide if our data is good or bad, depending on whether it's noisy, depending on whether we make other measurements for self-consistency. It makes it much harder for us to lie to ourselves. It's not that we're dishonest people, it's just that we're humans and we're motivated by things that all humans are motivated by. And these can, these can warp your thinking if you're not careful. So uh, there was a grand moment. It was like one of the most intense moments of my scientific career when we finally got all the group together. This was in 2017, the last time we made a really big measurement. And we told the computer, okay, stop lying to us. Tell us the actual number. Um, and we were all uh, we were all in the lab at the same time. And it told us, and if you zoom in, it said, yeah, the electric dipole moment is consistent with zero and it's less than this, this number. And so we were happy because this number was a much smaller number that had been measured before, but we were a little bit sad that it was consistent with zero. We're, um, so here is a, uh, a sort of historical, F, uh, historical plot. This goes back now 50 years, people trying to measure the electric dipole moment. This is a log plot here. So the measurement has gotten better by you know, six orders of magnitude or whatever this is here over the last few years. And uh, this, you can sort of see that uh, the measurements were sort of kind of plateauing out here in the early part of the century. 
but then uh, the Harvard Yale group, um, who are, are sort of our primary competitors. And if you don't mind, when I say the word Harvard Yale, it, it'd be good if you kind of went like this. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah. So anyway, the Harvard Yale group. Yeah, measured this measurement uh, right shortly before we did. And then we made a measurement. Uh, and these aren't actual measurements of the electric dipole moment. These are limits. Basically, the Harvard Yale group said, if the electric dipole moment exists at all, it's less than this green dot. And a couple of years later, we said, yeah, we agree. We got the more or less the same limit. So that was fine for a little while. But then uh, about uh, three years ago, two years ago, let's see here. Uh, oh, and the other thing about these two measurements is that they were, the theorists had expected them to be not zero. And because they were zero, they didn't agree with this, uh, everyone's favorite extension to the main theory of particle physics. Um, the main theor theory of particle physics is called the standard model of particle physics. And everyone thought, well, there's this new improvement to it called the supersymmetry. And uh, our, because our our measurements don't really agree with supersymmetry. We helped uh, murder supersymmetry. We uh, we have no regrets. We make no apologies. It had it coming. It, it flew too high, too close to the sun. You know, it was full of itself for many years. Like for 20 years, everyone everyone really liked this theory, but there was no data for it. And now there's data against it. Um. So that was a high point for us. Um. And that's fine. But then a little time goes by and. The Harvard Yale group says, okay, we just made a measurement still consistent with zero, a factor of 10 better. So at the time this happened, we were, my favorite television show was on. So I thought, you know, that's just rude. You know, <laughs> why are they going ahead and showing us up by doing a factor of 10 better? So uh, uh, we are in the process and we'll in, sometime this year make a measurement which is also about as good as that measurement. We don't know what we'll get. You know, their measurement was consistent with zero, but maybe they screwed it up. Maybe the actual, actual answer is not zero. We'll measure a number with the same size error bars and maybe we'll get zero and maybe we won't. But we're also a little bit tired of also always running sort of second in this race. And so we're building an elaborate new machine and brought in some new students to think, rethink the whole problem. We think somewhere around three years from now, we're gonna have a much better measurement, which will be way down here. Um, so that by that time, um, there are, you know, after the death of supersymmetry, there, there are other replacement theories came along. Most of these replacement theories do predict that the electron will have an electric dipole moment. So as we see it, we're either setting out to murder these theories, which would be fun, or else to see an electric dipole moment, which would also be fun. And so that's kind of our, our, our job these days. Uh, and I guess I'm gonna, at this point, I'm going to stop and say, Thank you for your attention. And um, I'm really at your disposal. You can ask any question you want. You can ask about uh, this experiment. Uh, you can ask about cosmology and particle physics and astrophysics, remembering that I'm actually a laser physicist that measures things precisely, but I'll give it my best shot. You can ask me where my arm went. You can ask me what being a physicist is like. Everything is on the table. And so for now, I'm going to uh, stop sharing and pause for questions. I see there are many, many chat I have to, I don't have enough mental bandwidth to look at the chat at the same time. So I could go and look at the chat or someone could like pick some interesting things out of the chat, whatever you want to do. We you know, have, a, we have yeah. a team that's monitoring a document and okay. um, they're gonna ask you the questions on behalf of me. Uh, hi, hi, Dr. Cornell. Um, our first question is, if anti-electrons are essentially electrons with a positive charge, what is an anti-neutron? Mm. Yeah, that's a good question. Anti-neutrons are, they are a lot, they are a lot more like neutrons than, you know, that's a terrific question. They really aren't the same. Like an anti-neutron and a neutron is not the same. Um, but it's, they both have zero charge. Uh, one way to describe the difference between a neutron is if you have a neutron just sitting there, uh, unless a neutron is embedded into a nucleus, a neutron just sitting there will decay. And when a neutron decays, it will become a proton. A, it, it, and it will spit out an electron. So neutrons, just a free neutron sitting in a lab will spit out a proton, a heavy positive particle, an electron, a light negative particle. 
if you have an anti-neutron, if it's just sitting there, when it decays, it will spit out an antiproton, a heavy negative particle, and an anti-electron, a light positive particle. So one of the easiest ways to tell if you're dealing with a neutron or an anti-neutron is to wait for about 10 minutes. And when it decays, is the heavy particle positive or negative? Is the negative particle negative or positive? And that will let you know whether it's a neutron or an anti-neutron. Interesting question, yeah. So our next question is, um, what do you think about combining physics with philosophy or other liberal art topics? For context, I read your writing about what, God, what was God thinking in a theology class a few years ago and found your idea that intelligent design shouldn't be explored in physics very interesting. Yeah, I wrote that article for uh, Time Magazine years ago. Um, yeah, I think it's I think it's great. I my my personal opinion is that uh, you know physics has been around for a long time. Uh, it was a lot of other sciences disciplines are much more modern. the The problem that we the problems that we thought were interesting in physics in the 1920s or the 1950s those problems have all been solved. Um, so physics remains interesting by moving into you know, identifying new questions. And uh, I think some of the most interesting physics is sort of at the boundary of physics, where physics overlaps with chemistry or medicine or biology or astronomy. Um, you know, I think these are like the most exciting areas of physics, physics, hyphenated physics, physics something. And uh, yeah, the philosophy of physics, these, these are interesting topics, I think. Um, and people have used, even people have even used, uh, physics ideas, uh, sort of statistical mechanics and thermodynamics ideas to try and like understand the behavior of stock markets and things like that. They call it econophysics, econo-physics. I, I think all these things are great. <clears throat> there are some people who believe like we need to maintain the purity of the discipline. And I say the heck with the purity of the discipline. If we were a pure discipline, we would have died 50 years ago. You know, um, uh, the, the stuff that's sort of considered like, you know, some of the most interesting physics these days is like solid state physics. And back in the 1930s, solid state physics was considered very suspect, very sort of frou-frou, very, very, very technical, you know, not really relevant. These days it's considered some of the most, you know, now the solid state physicists think that they're very pure and they, and they look down their nose at the biophysicists and I just think they're totally nuts, right? So uh, don't listen to them. Don't go into high energy particle physics because it's dying. Um, but there's a lot of cool physics which isn't dying, and that tends to be around the edges. So our, our next question is, uh, how did losing your arm affect your work, and uh, how did you persevere afterwards? It didn't, uh, I, I would say that the, I mean, when I lost my, I lost my arm because I got very sick. Getting sick affected my work because I was sort of weak and dumb for a long time. I was in a coma for several weeks, and let me tell you, you can't write papers when you're in a coma. Um, and even when I got out, I would say for about six months, even longer, I wasn't really firing on all six cylinders. Um, I spent a lot of time at home recovering, working out, stretching my scars and so on. Um, but after that part, after that sort of part of, it, it didn't change my, my physics very much because even before I lost my arm, uh, I was a fairly senior physicist. I had graduate students who were working in the lab and my personal philosophy is that if a graduate student is working on a project, that should be her project and not mine. And I don't like to come in and turn the knobs, you know, on the project uh, because I want my students to think like whether this experiment works or not, that's on me. And I don't want them to imagine that I'm going to come in and, and fix things. And as time goes by, call it a self-fulfilling prophecy because I'm not in there turning the knobs, touching things. I get less good at it. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm good at telling people to turn the knobs and try things or suggesting ideas. Uh, my, my manual skills in the lab were already a lot, uh, pretty kind of atrophied by the time I lost my arm. So it wasn't a very big change. Every once in a while, I'll go into the lab and I'll be like a summer student there, like a summer high school student. And, you know, I, you know, I tell them like, you know, with that soldering iron, you really want to hold it on the blue part and not on the dull gray part. The dull gray part's going to burn your hand, you know, the blue part, the part you hold, you know, or you really need to heat the metal, not the solder. And I try to so show them how it's done with one arm and the results are predictably comical. You know, I end up, I end up burning myself and trying to show them how not to burn them, them, themselves just because, you know, trying to like 
soldering really requires a good job of soldering requires three hands, um, and one is just not enough. So um, it doesn't change things that very much. I was in the lab actually physically in the lab on Friday because we were we had just had the the lab remodeled and like it was a big team building exercise. We had the paint rollers. I had a little tiny brush and was painting around the outside of all the wall plugs, you know, before the rollers came along. And so that was good. I felt like I was actually like manual stuff again, because experimental physics is very, very manual. Like you're, you're building things, you're doing stuff with your hands. That's why I always loved it. But yeah, it didn't change so much. As for persevering, you know, the question is what's the alternative? You know, it, it, it's not like I had some other, other thing I was good at, some other gig I could get into. Um, Persevering was just the the the, uh, the more or less the choice that there was. So yeah. Um, our next question is: Would you would you prefer to murder further theories or find a dipole moment? Oh. Well, officially, I have to say I have to prefer to murder further theories because that is a way of insulating my psyche against disappointment. <laughs> but the truth is I'd love to see an electric dipole moment. Yeah, I can't lie. That would be really cool. Um, and so I, I, I enjoy the, you know, setting the improved limit like that. Uh, that really makes me happy too, but not quite as totally thrilled as it would be as to actually see a positive result. If we did, the thing is that's if we, especially if we, we published a paper saying we, we measured it, it's not zero, here's what it is. It's kind of like speaking of paint, like dipping a, your brush in red paint and drawing a bunch of concentric circles on your back. Like everyone's going to try and shoot you down, saying like, "No, you measured it wrong." Uh, so it'll be uh, it, it will be like your next few years after you measure, it will be sort of defending that result as it should be because it's a really big deal and it really would be easy to screw it up. So other people will try to reproduce it. Uh, you need to check up on their work and back and forth. So there's a certain amount of rough and tumble there, which is part of the scientific method. If you measure zero, there's less controversy. Uh, although it's not clear to me that that's really correct. You know, the Acme group, sorry, the Harvard Yale group. Harvard Yale group, yeah. The Harvard Yale group uh, recently measured this value, which was a very, very small error bar consistent with zero. It could be wrong. And we'll soon have our own measurement, same, similar size error bars. And if we measure a me measurement, which is, if we measure an answer, which is not zero, our official position will be that they messed up, right? Uh, that they, you know, they made a small error which canceled out the actual electron dipole moment and got them zero. And uh, and that will be, I would look forward to that um, discussion. And plus you do more measurements, you got a third person to check, check over all the work. Yeah, yeah, but sure, it'd be fun to see an electric dipole moment, but it's also fun to murder theories. So sort of a similar question on that vein, um, what are some other explanations for your detection of the dipole moment of the electron through its oscillation? Or are we certain that such a moment exists? Did you say that one time? Are we sure that what exists? Um, I think it's saying, are we sure that the dipole moment exists? Um, we're not sure. And there are other, there are other, The problem is, it, it is kind of hard. It's kind of hard to explain the, the, this original called the baryon antibaryon, like the proton, antiproton, electron, antielectron. It's hard to explain that asymmetry without also like the, the, it's difficult to write a theory that explains that, that doesn't also predict these modern day uh, vector dipole moments. Now they can predict smaller ones. Um, you know, various ways in which they can sort of accidentally cancel. You know, there's two different physical effects and they sort of cancel out in the electron. If they were to cancel out in the electron, then there should almost surely be electric dipole moments in some other particle. There are a couple of groups which are looking very hard to find electric dipole moment in the neutron and in other particles and atomic nuclei. Uh, and it may just be that they're too small for us to see, but they're almost surely there. I think, it's, I think it'd be very difficult to make a, a consistent theoretical story of physics that didn't predict electric dipole moments. Uh, our next question is, uh, please describe how you felt when you won the Nobel Prize and how did you react to it? It felt good for sure. Um, 
it was a, uh, it also felt kind of sleepy. Um, they, 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 they have this election, you know, the Swedish Acad Royal Academy uh, puts the final stamp of approval and they finish their voting at about 11.45 a.m. in Sweden, which is 3.45 a.m. in Boulder. And, uh, and then they try to call you, but you know, my number's not in the telephone book. Uh, so they weren't able to call me and it got to be about four o'clock and, and just outside the, 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 the meeting room of the Royal Academy, the press were gathered. So they uh, went outside and they announced the results. And uh, so a lot of people like, you know, listening to NPR at 6 a.m. in the morning on the East Coast heard about it before I did because um, I was sleeping. I was sleeping, but my wife wasn't sleeping and my daughter wasn't sleeping. My daughter had a, uh, was having a flare up of her asthma. So my wife was giving her an albuterol nebulizer treatment, uh, which she has since grown out of. But uh, we were tr trading back and forth. If it had been two hours earlier, I would have been awake doing the albuterol treatment. But we know we're, we're, we're swapping shifts. And uh, so, you know, the phone rang and I, I picked it up and it turned out that the person who called me was my old thesis advisor. Dave Pritchard, that you heard his name at the very beginning of this talk, he had gotten uh, his, uh, the, the person I shared it with, one of the people I shared it with was Wolfgang Ketterly. Wolfgang Ketterly was at MIT and his postdoctoral advisor had been Dave Pritchard. So he called Dave Pritchard and Dave Pritchard waited and said, oh yeah, I want it. Eric got it. Carl got it. Dave Pritchard waited until like 6.15 or something so I could hear it, hear the good news from someone with a, a Swedish accent but I never did, they never were able to call me. And uh, so Dave Pritchard is actually very appropriate, like my thesis advisor, I was very happy to hear the news from him, but I was also a little suspicious because when you get to grad school, the, the relationship between the, the advisor and the advisee is a complicated one. You know, yes, he or she is your advisor, but they're also your boss, you know, and they want you to work hard and you want to work hard, but maybe not on the same thing. So. You know, there had been a certain amount of give and take in my relationship with Dave Pritchard and, and including a certain number of pranks here and there. So I, the first thing I asked Dave is like, um, uh, is it possible that uh, you are, you know, having a little fun with your old student? And because uh, that would be very, very funny, but now I want to go back to sleep. And uh, they said, well, look, Eric, in all the years that you worked, we worked together, did you ever see me in the lab before like 10 in the morning? Remember, it's 6 a.m. here at MIT. I said, no, that's true. You wouldn't have gone up this early in the morning just to play a joke. So then, yeah, I believed it. And it made me happy to win it. Um, some years earlier, so this was 2001, and 1995 is when we first observed BEC. In some sense, that was a bigger deal for me because I went from being a obscure assistant professor barely getting going to becoming, you know, someone who gave keynote addresses at conferences and, and a much, much more easy time in getting my, my grant proposals funded and so on. So I think it was a bigger change in my life, call it logarithmically speaking, <laughs> when I went from being a, uh, a, a, a assistant professor to an assistant professor who had seen Bose-Einstein condensation, then I went from being an already tenured full professor with various privileges and so on to being one who had a Nobel prize. That was in some sense was, was a smaller step, as I say, uh, logarithmically speaking. So, you know, I mean, it was good, but it, it didn't completely change my life. The other thing is I live in Boulder, Colorado, which is a, a sporty athletic town. We worship college athletes. There's probably five college football players walking around Boulder with greater name and face recognition than I have. And, you know, um, I don't, I don't get it's it's different from being in, in some countries there's a very there's a um there's sort of a cult of the nobel prize you know they're considered to be minor deities and um uh that's not and that would, I think would be kind of a drag <laughs> um so it's it's good i don't have to, i can I, I could briefly i could go to stockholm there's a big party i was briefly a celebrity i could come home and go back to being just sort of a, a regular person which is kind of how you, I would prefer to live my life. Um, our next question is, could you describe your work with those Einstein condensates, what they are and what did you do with them? Uh, so those Einstein condensates uh, are uh, very cold. Uh, basically they're, the, you know, they, at the time they, we saw them, they were the coldest stuff in the universe. Um, and as you get things, as you get gases colder and colder, 
you know, the whole notion of quantum mechanics is that everything acts partly like a wave and partly like a particle. And Bose-Einstein condensation is sort of the, as you get colder and colder, the wavy aspect sort of dominates over the particle aspect. And Bose-Einstein condensation is kind of, kind of like the triumph of the waviness. So we, we cool a gas to a, a few tens of nano Kelvin. So a few tens of billionths of a degree within absolute zero. The atoms, their, their thermal velocities are like a millimeter per second or something. They're barely moving. They're very wavy. And the wave of one atom overlaps with the wave of the other atom. And they form this single, like a, like a highly gelled Reagan-esque pompadour kind of, uh, all, the way, all the pairs are doing exactly the same thing. Like, except they're not hairs, they're atoms, all sort of doing this wave. And that's, uh, it, it, the texture is kind of like, it's, it's the very, very low density, but the texture is sort of like jello. It's like sort of goopy stuff and it's a super fluid. It can flow through small holes without, uh, without uh, dissipation, without friction. Uh, has many other sort of surprising quanti uh, features. So um, yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a, in some sense, I could have given you the talk about Bose-Einstein condensation instead, except that that was uh, 25 years ago and I, I'm a little, I'm a little bored with it. <laughs> it's like, you know, being in the, being, being astral Gilberto and, and, Someone ask, always asking you to play Girl from Ipanema, you know. Yeah, it was a great song. Totally, totally kick-ass song. But like you probably, if I were asked to develop Gilberto, I'd probably get pretty tired of singing it, so. Um, so this is my own question. Um, so when you trap the electrons in that electron trap, does that generate Cooper pairs? And is that how the superfluid is formed? Um, okay, so the superfluid, I'm just to be clear, like, I've talked about various different things. Uh, the, the, the EDM experiments who are trapping ions, um, there's no superfluid. So the, the electron is actually just, it just, we're just using a molecule which already has an electron in it. We're trapping the molecule, the molecule's got an electron and then we're doing the, the resonance on the molecule and nothing is superfluid. It's not even especially cold. It's about 10 degrees Kelvin, which is to say minus 263 degrees Celsius. And I realize that sounds hot to you, but from my point of view, it's uh, you know, it's only it's only twenty degrees, only twenty times colder than room temperature, but it's about a billion times hotter than where I usually operate in for my Bose-Einstein condensation. So twenty degrees Kelvin for me is essentially room temperature. So these are warm experiments, the EDM experiments. The superfluidity happens in Bose-Einstein condensation, and um, you were asking about Cooper pairs. Uh, so electrons have spin one half and, and in order to for a superconductivity they have to pair together. There is an analogy to that. My Bose-Einstein condensation that I worked on used atoms which are called bosons and they don't have to pair up. Uh, my longtime colleague here at the University of Colorado, a woman named Deborah Jin, did, did the sort of things I did but did them with fermionic uh, molecules, atoms. Had to make the atoms much, much colder. Also saw superfluidity this time by the atoms pairing up a la PCS super super conductivity, and so uh, she um, she was sort of a she became sort of an international superstar doing this much harder experiment than the experiments I did. She tragically died actually in, in her late forties. It was very, it was just tremendously sad just a few years ago, and uh, I'm not over it. <laughs> uh, we we had worked together for many years, um, so uh, but that's a Sorry, that took a dark turn. Yeah, so um, yeah, so that's uh, the there is an analogy between these Cooper pairs and stuff with cold atoms, but not in the Bose-Einstein condensate. Instead, in, in the in the degenerate Fermi gases is the phrase they use to describe Debbie's work. Uh, so our next question is: What are your thoughts on the origin of the universe and the matter and antimatter that was in it? Uh, I don't have much thought on the origin of the universe. Uh, and the, as for the matter and antimatter, I, I don't, I don't, I, I don't, um, I can't add very much. Uh, I, I feel like uh, if I start everything I know about, you know, cosmology and, and, and like that, I learned from, you know, reading articles and, you know, sort of like popular science articles. I never, I never studied that in grad school or anything like that. And uh, you all are actually doing real uh, astrophysics experiments. And so I'm a little reluctant to, to just sort of ramble on. 
in front of experts such as yourselves. Okay. Uh, um, our next question is, do you think that falsifiable physics hypotheses are worth pursuing? Sure, sure. Some people say only falsifiable uh, hypotheses are worth pursuing. I don't know if I'd go quite that far, but um, yeah, you, you like to be able to um, do something definitive and you know it's much easier to disprove something than prove it. So yeah, absolutely. Um, so the next question is uh, a big one. Um, per Hawking radiation, a matter antimatter particle is created near the event horizon of a black hole. Is there an argument here on the randomness of the particle that falls in versus escapes? And could this be an example of particle asymmetry in the universe? Oh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, um, there are uh, you know pairs of particles. Um, Usually they're, they're pairs of photons um, at the event horizon. So it's not exactly matter antimatter because photons don't have an antiphoton, um, but they are created. One photon comes out in the form of a black body radiation from a, from a black hole and one falls in. Um, a negative energy photon falls in. So the, the actual mass of the, of, the, of, the, um, of the black hole goes down a tiny amount as this black body radiation comes out. So no, I don't think um, I don't think that does explain what I'm thinking about because that's not really matter antimatter going on there. I think that's just sort of positive energy and negative energy particles. Um, so I'm a little out of my depth, but I would say no, I don't think that's the um, that's what's going on. But I also uh, will do that earlier disclaimer, which is I feel like I'm getting in over my head a little bit. Um, our next question is, uh, what is your reply to those who think that these types of particle physics experiments are not worth a high price point compared to some of the other more human-focused human physics, venture, physics ventures? Well, bear in mind that my experiment is not a high, not a, high, uh, a $20 billion, um, not a $20 billion experiment, which I think is what you're getting at. My experiment so, has a, a relatively small number of graduate students and those graduate students are, you know, they're getting, they're learning a lot of really good stuff. You know, they're, um, you know, measuring things precisely, all kinds of lasers, all kinds of vacuum. You know, my, my goal for my students is that they come through the lab and write a PhD on, on some topic. And so they're, yes, they're an expert in this very particular topic and they write a hundred page paper or whatever it is on this particular topic. But my goal for them is to be all around general technological badasses. You know, I want them to come out feeling like you got a problem, it has to do with, you know, I know how to solve it. If I don't know how to solve it, I know where to look it up. And um, there's just, you know, when, you're, when you are doing your PhD, working on like a very complicated, interesting technological problem, it's just super good training. So these, my students right now, some of them could become professors, but most of them are going into, um, you know, into uh, industry to create, you know, quantum computing and quantum logic and all these sorts of things. Is that human focused? I don't know if I want to debate that one way or another. It's definitely human focused in the sense that people, humans want to pay the money to like build these things because they want to buy them, you know. So it's definitely practical, relevant. Uh, human focused can carry a lot of weight that might be, you might mean something else like humanitarian focused or something. And I don't know if I would, would put quantum computing in, in that category. Um, so I feel like uh, if the, you know, the government is, and the government, my government, I mean, taxpayers or your parents probably are paying for these experiments that I'm doing. Um, and I feel what the country is getting for it is, yeah, the papers I write, explaining whether it's electron or electron dipole moment, but much more so what they're getting for that is absolutely sort of crackerjack top of the line technologists, you know, small scale laboratory based technologists. And you can't really learn how to do that in a class, you know. Um, so um, I think 
the country is getting good value for the money. Um, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm biased for it. Um, certainly, my students get hired just exactly as fast as I can find, sign their theses. Um, our next question is, what do you think about theorized Majorana particles? Uh, yeah, so uh, Major, Majorana, Majorana particles, uh, they are their own antiparticle. Um, and I'm going to say I have no opinion. Uh, I'm sorry to duck some of these questions. These questions which are more explicitly particle physics, more explicitly cosmology, explicitly astrophysics. I'll give up when I come when I can, I'll give them my best shot. But um, I don't like just running on at the mouth if I don't know what I'm talking about. And I feel like I owe you more accuracy than that. So more of a non-technical question. Um, before you awarded the Nobel Prize, did you know you're going to get it for the fruits of your research? Uh, it's funny you should mention that because um, the year not, so I won it in 19, uh, 2001. The year before, in 2000, um, there was like the, the process of, uh, the, like the, it's supposed to be very secretive, you know, it's supposed to be, uh, you're, you know, there are no one's, but you don't know that you're nominated, you don't know if you're considered, you don't know if you came in second place, you're not supposed to know any of these things. But, so, you know, someone did say, Eric, you didn't hear it from me, but this is your year. I'm going like, oh, no, this was 2000. Really? Mom's the word. Okay. So it comes to be, you know, a day in September 2000. And, you know, if you're in, in this business, it's a little bit like if you're a movie actor, you know, when the, when the Oscars are, <laughs> when the Academy Awards are. And, and if you're a physicist, you tend to know when, the, on what day they're going to announce the Nobel Prize. So that the night before I knew that the call comes at four o'clock in the morning. So I had trouble going to sleep and I dreamed that I had, I had this dream that the phone was ringing and I wake up and the phone wasn't ringing. And then finally I woke up, it was daylight, right? It was like 6 a.m. and the 4 a.m. and come and gone. And I said, Eric, you are such a schmuck. I can't believe you fell for that. You gullible son of a bitch. And I just like, I was really angry with myself for like allowing myself to get suckered into that. And um, so uh, I said, never again, because I knew of people, I know of people who, thought they were going to win Nobel Prizes, never won Nobel Prizes, became embittered. Like I said, that's so not me. I'm, I'm not into this for the Nobel Prizes. You know, I'm not going to be that person. And so the next year, um, 2001, when I did win it, like two or three days before, I get a call from the university publicity people. And they say, well, we've been hearing these rumors and we don't want to be caught off guard. So we want to make contingency plans for you to have a press conference in case you should win. And I'm going like, you know, talk to the click, you know, click. <laughs> and um, that was that. And so I slept like a baby, uh, except for like uh, two hours earlier, I got up to do the albuterol treatment, but at 4 a.m., none of these weird dreams, I was, I was over that. I was pretty sure that that was just a fantasy. <laughs> uh, so our next question is, uh, is the Planck's length the smallest possible precision you are looking for? And uh, if you don't find the electron dipole moment of that precision, does that mean it doesn't exist? Well, um, before we get to the Planck's length, <coughs> uh, I should say that in existing particles, um, people already know that some, some existing particles have some asymmetries. And because of this, uh, we know that the electron will have an electric dipole moment at about 10 to the minus 38 electron centimeters. The current limit is 10 to the minus 30, tw sorry, minus 29. So if we were to make a measurement, which is nine orders of magnitude better, I don't think anyone will ever do that. We know we would see an electric dipole moment, but an electric dipole moment would not be very interesting. It would be the consequence of particle physics we already know about. And, and so um, it wouldn't be like a, a key to understanding new particle physics to explain like the asymmetry of the Big Bang and so on. So um, that length scale is, uh, doesn't, doesn't require invoking you know, Planck scale physics or anything like that. So uh, I would say short answer is uh, no. Um, uh, I'm not sure I want to say that the Planck scale is the smallest possible 
length. I do want to say that we are we know for sure that things that happen on at that length scale, you flip it over, you get a momentum scale, that momentum scale, that energy scale, that all of our existing physics won't work there. So I would say that that's a, a, a threshold for absolute confidence. I mean, we know with absolute confidence that none of our existing physics will work at that point. Uh, on the other hand, we can also say with quite a bit of confidence that our particle accelerators will never get to that energy and my precision will never really probe that either. So may may continue to be a mystery. Um, next question is, what inspired you to begin researching particle physics as opposed to other fields of physics or chemistry? Really, I was inspired to get into, uh, I don't know, it was called AMO physics, atomic molecular optical physics. Um, and, you know, I loved the, the, the sort of the, the control you could have, the fact that you could sort of make individual atoms and electrons sing and dance and, and you know, line up like trained bears at a circus or something like that. Uh, I was, I was, I was, I thought quantum mechanics was cool. Quantum mechanics between interacting particles, totally cool. Um, and it just happened to be more or less by accident, if you like, that it turned out that the kind of physics I was doing yields very high precision and precision, I should come back to this, it sort of takes me back to the beginning of my, my talk. Precision is sort of the third leg of the three-legged stool. You've got telescopes, you've got accelerators, and you've got precision measurements as a way of getting at new particle physics. And so I came to precision measurement from, the, from a very non-particle physics route, I mean, being, being an AMO physicist. But one of the things you can do with precision measurement is you can probe for new particle physics. So for me, it's more like I had a hammer and I'm looking for a nail. And um, my hammer is like, you know, very, very precise spectroscopy. And the nail in this case was particle physics. So. Um, I wasn't, wasn't coming to this from the idea that I never got into this thinking that my goal was to do particle physics. Um, so the next question, what theories do you wonder about that can't be proved using your field of research? For example, you're a geologist wondering about the stars. I guess uh, I would love to my field of research is never going to tell us very much about human consciousness. Like, that's a really cool problem. How come we're aware that we're aware, you know? Uh, I find that a super deep problem. Um, origins of life, that's not really going to come out of my, my world. Um, uh, cures for diseases, you know, super important, really interesting. Not, not my, you know, I think it's all kinds of physics uh, things that I find really interesting that, my thing is not gonna, I'm never gonna get at. Uh, and, you know, fair enough. I'm, you know, I don't, it would be an unusual scientist who felt that he or she could tackle any problem. <laughs> um, other people will. Um, let's see. Uh, I think there's lots of questions in uh, like the developmental biology, like how a little, this, my brother works, and this is why I think about it, like how this little bundle of cells you know, which is like that, you, the, the original egg is divided like 10 times. It's like a thousand cells. It's like a little ball. How does that little ball eventually develop into a mammal? You know, it's, it's, it's my, my brother knows a bunch about this and he, he tells me these stories and they're really cool. Um, he works with zebrafish, which are not especially interesting as fish, but they're interesting because they're uh, up until they're like a month old, they're transparent. So you want to see how they're developing, you just look at them, you know, you can see right through them. And um, so they're a great model for learning about development and, and vertebrates, not mammals, but, you know, things with backbones like we have. Um, our next question is, uh, if you had the opportunity to research your career now, what field of physics do you think has the most potential or is the most, or is the most exciting? Um, I tried to get at that a little earlier. I think some of the hyphenated areas of physics are pretty exciting. Um, I think uh, the, uh, and conversely, I'm sort of somewhat wary of the pure purest physics um, questions because I feel like we, uh, the new pure physics questions will be, you know, tomorrow's pure physics questions will be today's hyphenated physics questions. So, uh, but I don't know which of those areas in particular I would get into. And, um, I don't know what's going to be like the really exciting physics question of, of five years from now. If, if, you know, if I did, why would I tell you I'd be setting up to do it myself? But, no, I don't no, honest. I'd share it with you. But uh, yeah, so it's uh, 
physics, um, but I can't emphasize enough that, that physics, like all of science, physics, sure, is, uh, is a human activity, like people do it. And it's subject to all the sort of things that go through other areas of like, like fashions, you know, like clothing design is influenced by clothing design fashions. Physics is, is, is and all science are influenced by, you know, ideas which have like probably too much currency, too much interest right now, just because people are, are glomming onto it. These things happen. They're, it's influenced by by vanity, um, by by hopefulness, um, you know, all these sort of uh, good and bad things about about people map, you know, find their way into the, the practice of science just because uh, it's just us people who are doing them, you know. Um, I think that since on the topic of scientists as people, there's this notion of of scientists as being sort of uh, antisocial um, or physicists. And uh, it's not something I've seen, you know, um, the, the day when like sort of the lone genius in his or her lab could make big discoveries, those days are kind of gone. You know, the, the way you do a really cool experiment is you get together with other smart people and you work together to make it happen. Otherwise the experiments are too hard. So it's it just, it's, it, it's, it's explicitly a, a social activity. I go to conferences partly to learn like what's the, the hottest new thing, but also to go see my friends, right? Like I have friends in, in, in 30 different countries that I've been seeing at, at physics conferences and, and at workshops and things like that for 30 years. So um, I, I don't know how I got onto this track, but. <laughs> um, our next question is, what advice would you give to aspiring physicists to help them find the specific area of research they feel passionate about? Yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, there's, I, I have advice for like specific, specific skills that some scientists will neglect, which is a little different from how do you find the one you're most passionate about? Like for instance, a lot of scientists neglect writing. Uh, you would be astonished how much writing you have to do as a scientist. You write, grant proposals and, and project reports and uh, papers, sure, but, you know, and theses and, uh, and, and all, all kinds of stuff, you end up, uh, you, know, you know, grade reports and, and, and uh, you know, committee reports as a professor. And you, so you spend a lot of time writing. And so if you're able to uh, <clears throat> write with some facility, you know, not having to like struggle over every single word, and in a way that people can understand and is not too long, it's just super useful. And, and like everything else, it's a skill and you can get better at it. So don't neglect your, I think scientists tend to say, oh, well, you know, I'm gonna to go to college. I have to take these classes. You know, they'll probably make me take these classes in the humanities, maybe these classes in the arts. And I wanna make sure I don't have to take a class where I have to do any writing because writing is slow and boring. Don't do that, you know, embrace the classes where you have to do writing. Um, and you know, writing better about writing a, a better essay about you know art history will will it's, it's still just writing, right? You'll you'll write a better grant proposal. Um, I took a I took a create I took a creative writing I, I took a short story writing class in college, and I don't say that my proposals are are fictional short stories, but there are fictional aspects to them. <laughs> and so um, and and. And also a way you get good at, at, at writing is reading. Um, you know, most you know, read, read, read well-written things and, and, and notice what makes them good. I, you know, and it's not what you usually hear about for, for science and it's easy to neglect. And uh, the, you know, so, yeah. Um, so the next question is, do you think science could ever undermine religion? Could you provide general commentary on the conflict between religion and science? I, you know, I've never really seen religion and science as in conflict. Um, and I, I feel that, uh, you know, my personal feeling is that they concern themselves with different sorts of questions. Um, it's true that uh, sometimes either science or religion kind of gets pretty far out of their lane. You know, um, we have examples of, of uh, Galileo being persecuted or something like that for, for, for proposing a certain you know, model of the solar system. 
but I, I feel like those are those aren't intrinsic to religion or intrinsic to science, you know. Um, and uh, so I I sort of feel like if you're that um, you know there are scientists who have faith, you know, and there are religious people who you know who are very much involved in science. Uh, I, I don't see it as a big conflict. Um, and yeah, there, there are, I guess there are obviously are times when they sort of bump against each other, but uh, I sort of feel like if you, if you feel like religion is, your religion is somehow science, you're not focused on the really interesting importance of your religion. Uh, the next question is, do you think any of the attempts to quantize gravity, such as string, string theory or loop quantum theory, have any uh, promises? Uh, am I frozen? Can people see me? Am I okay? Okay. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 you know, when I, when I read about loop gravity and things like that, it's because I've, I've, I've bought like Lee Smolin's book, which was written for the general public, not even, not even for specialized physicists. I don't know about that stuff. Um, so I don't have an answer for that. Again, I'm sorry to let, let you down. Um, next question is, what is your take on the recent news on muons and leptons and their impact on the standard model? Okay, so uh, muon is a lepton. And I think this question might be about, uh, you know, I was talking about the electric dipole moment, but electrons and muons also have magnetic dipole moments. A muon, for those who don't know, is just like a big fat electron. It's a, it looks, it, it acts just like an electron, except it's about, I think, 300 times heavier or something like that. I might have that number a little wrong. And uh, it doesn't live as long as an electron. But like an electron, muons have a magnetic moment and you can measure that magnetic moment. And recently a group in um, Illinois measured the magnetic moment of the muon and found that it didn't agree with, with theory. And so their assertion is that there's some new particle physics that explains this discrepancy. Okay, uh, it's, I'm not sure I believe it. Uh, it's not like, I, 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 mean, I, admire the, I admire the experiment. I think it's, it's just that it's a, it's a very, very difficult experiment and, and the result so far is not, uh, <clears throat> could easily be wrong. Um, and so I feel like this is an experiment that needs to be done by other people, needs to be done again in different ways in order to sort of track down possible disagreements to see if it might just be an, a random effect. Uh, it could be a big deal and it could be not. Um, so, but it's definitely, it's definitely exciting. I, I actually sat in live on the press conference where they announced their results um, and it's big in my field. Uh, but I, I guess I'm not totally ready to say, yeah, I completely believe it. So this it's, it's happens often enough that these first efforts to see something turn out to be wrong. It's not a not an indictment of uh, physics or the experimental process. I mean, in some sense, the whole experimental process is everyone piles on, looks more carefully, checks it out. And if it is wrong, that's sort of like physics and science working, right? Uh, uh, and if it's and if people if it really checks out, people will have more and more confidence in it. And then over the course of a few years, it really will become like something which people think is is definitely real. That'll probably take a few more years. Um, so the next question is: uh, Is time reversal the same principle that requires operations on quantum states to be reversible? Ooh. Okay, that is an interesting question. You want operations on quantum states to be reversible because you don't want dissipation. Uh, and um, uh, don't rush me. It's <laughs> there, there. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a cool question. Um, I want to say I want to say no. I think you have you could have this microscopic time reversal violation and not have it cause a lot of problems for quantum physics. It, the, the 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 you know the, the, the when they reverse operations and they don't reverse well, that problem basically isn't 
time the time kind of time reversal um, violations that I'm referring to. It's more um, what's called decoherence, basically your quantum system talking to a larger quantum system and exchanging information and energy and so on, so on, back and forth. I think you could have you could do quantum computing with particles that are intrinsically time reversal violating. That's what I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb. Um, this the first time I ever thought me, I've thought about that question, but I think that it's there's sufficiently different ideas that I think uh, that's what I think. Uh, the next question is: Are you still in touch with Dr. Ketterl and Dr. Wyman? You bet. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Carl Wyman's like uh, one of my best friends. Uh, we we. Uh, <coughs> um, my wife and Carl and his wife, we have uh, like the four of us have like Zoom dinners sometimes. You know, he lives in California now. I haven't seen him in person in going on two years. But uh, uh, so Carl and I work together. And yeah, so we, we're still good, good pals. He's gone on, you know, I don't do BEC anymore. He doesn't do BEC anymore. Uh, so we've gone on our, intro, our intellectual interests have sort of diverged, but we're still pals. Uh, Wolfgang Ketterle uh, was originally my, my competitor, right? Carl and I and Wolfgang were on different teams, if you like, trying to see Bose-Einstein condensation. Uh, maybe for that reason, I don't have quite as close a relationship with Wolfgang, but he's an excellent guy. Uh, you know, if we're in town at the same conference, we'll share a beer. Um, and uh, he's, uh, last time I saw him was on Zoom. And for some reason, it was not very long ago. I remember, you know, just exchanging a few you know, happy words with, you know, we were at some, some event. I don't remember what it was. So yeah, um, definitely very in contact with both of them. And if I'm in, if I'm in Cambridge, I'll look up Wolfgang, you know. Um, could you please elaborate a bit more on lasers and some of the specifics of how your specialization comes into play with your experiments? Yeah, well, lasers are, are huge in physics. They're, they're used for many, many different things. They're just such a, a general tool. And, and there are so many different kinds of lasers. It's hard to say anything too general about them. But, you know, they're sources of, of light, which can be very powerful in some cases, very intense. In other cases, very fast, you know, very, very... Um, okay, it said the recording stopped. Should I, does that mean I should keep talking or does that mean anything? Um, that was because I hit something that I shouldn't have hit when I was. Oh, okay. But I apologize. Not at all. Um, and uh, not all these things apply at once. Some lasers are really quite weak, and what they're good for is is defining a really well precise, uh, real, really well de defining a really well defined frequency. Um, so there, it's hard to say one general thing about why they're so important and useful in experimental physics. Um, in, in our case, we use them to, you know, basically the, the molecules have internal states, you know, they're, they have a certain amount of vibration, a certain amount of rotation. The electron is lined up with the fluorine nucleus or anti-aligned with the fluorine nucleus. And the lasers can go in and change those things very delicately, like do nothing to the molecule except flip the electron over with respect to the nucleus or cause the molecule that is vibrating at one speed to vibrate at another speed or cause it the molecule that was rotating to rotate slower or faster, depending on how you, you tailor the properties of your laser. So really the lasers are kind of like our, our, our robot controlled fingers. My fingers are far too pudgy to reach in and grab a hafnium fluorine molecule and do something to it. But I can, I can touch the lasers and the lasers can do that. Um, I realize this is kind of a qualitative explanation, but it gets pretty involved. It would be the sort of feel of like using lasers to control and probe things is, uh, you know, not just one graduate course, it's many graduate courses. I know because I've taught some of them. Is there something intrinsic about measuring oscillation frequencies that makes that parameter easier to characterize at higher precision? precisions? Yeah, I think it is. I think it's because you're just counting, you know? Uh, you basically, an oscillation frequency is a wiggle. And, and you know, when you count, you can, can count, like say I've got 500 pennies. Uh, I can uh, count those 500 pennies plus or minus zero, right? They're discrete objects in the same way that a wiggle of a frequency is a discrete thing. So 
if I had uh, if I had 500 pennies and I wanted to know how many pennies they were by putting them on a scale, I'd have to have a pretty good scale. Like say I know how much one penny works weighs. If I could put the pennies on a scale, and if my scale was good enough, I might be able to tell them whether I had 499 or 501 or 500 pennies. Um, but if I had 50,000 pennies, I probably would not be able to tell whether I had 50,001 pennies or 49,999 pennies just by how much my chunk of pennies weighed. But I could, if I were patient enough, count all the pennies and find out exactly how many pennies I had. And so that's like with frequencies, you have this oscillation back and forth and you can count those with, with enormous precision, like how many wiggles are there? Not 10 wiggles, not 11 wiggles, there are nine wiggles. And yeah, we do a lot better than that. We also count 9.1 wiggles at the end. But the fact that uh, so many frequencies are very high, oscillating at billions of times per second, and we can count those billions of times. And then even if we don't do a very good job on the remainder, on the 0.1 or the 0.2 or 0.3, we've already measured the frequency to a part per billion without hardly making a measurement at all, just counting. Uh, the next question is, do you have any book recommendations? Uh, book recommendations. Um, no, I don't. Uh, I don't know that I have a good book recommendation. I recently read City of Thieves by David Benioff. Benioff is the showrunner for um, Game of Thrones. And he wrote a, a, a sort of a fictionalized novel on account of living in, in St. Petersburg during World War II, terrific novel, you know, but it had nothing to do with physics. <laughs> uh, then I also recently read another novel called Inherent Vice, which is by an uh, American author called Thomas Pynchon. Also really, really, really excellent novel. But again, nothing to do with, well, Thomas Pynchon was a novelist as, a grad, as an undergraduate, he was a physicist. Uh, uh, he was a physicist as an undergraduate, so his novels uh, have a lot of science in them, which I think was one of the reasons I like them. It's not real science. It's sort of like fictionalized science. So it's not a, you don't read them to learn science. You read them to sort of absorb science vibes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, but those, neither of those books are, are science books. It's true. I don't read a lot of, but for actually, these days, I don't read a lot of science books. I mostly go to science conferences and, or read science papers. Um, in journals. Um, what cooling mechanisms did you use to achieve such low temperatures in your experiments? Uh, something called laser cooling. Basically the force of the laser, uh, we think of, okay, uh, laser light comes broke up, broken up into photons, little particles of light. And we think of the particles of light as containing like sort of packages of pure energy and they are, but they also carry momentum. So if you have a laser being hitting the side of your face, your side of your face will warm up, but you also feel a sort of push. You probably won't feel a push because the push is really small. And uh, you might think that's because the photons are, are really small, but actually the real reason is because your head is, is too fat. You need something small. I don't mean to call you a fat head. I'm just sort of saying that you need something reasonable size like an atom or a molecule. Um, and if a photon bounces off an atom or a molecule, the molecule actually changes its velocity a little bit. If you bounce one, photon, one infrared photon off one rubidium atom, after it, the photon has bounced off, the rubidium atom's speed has changed by about half a centimeter per second. And you can bounce thousands of photons per second off a rubidium atom. So you can change its speed by uh, like a thousand meters per second so that uh, it's the, you know, the acceleration is hundreds or thousands of times the acceleration of gravity. And you can, using the amazing control you have lasers, you can use that force to slow atoms down instead of speeding them up. And of course, if you have a collection of atoms, the slower they move, the colder they are. So slowing atoms down is pretty much the same as refrigerating atoms. It's kind of as if the way, you imagine the way your refrigerator worked is like inside your refrigerator, this is a little robot hand and it reached and grabbed each each molecule of air and slowed it down a little bit and let go, grabbed another molecule, slowed it down and let go. If it kept doing that, eventually the air inside your refrigerator would get very cold. It would be hard to do because there's lots of molecules and they're going very fast. But um, using laser beams, you can do essentially that. So laser cooling was one source of cooling. Another call was called evaporative cooling. The atoms, like a lot of things, are, are like little magnetic 
dipoles, a north pole and a south pole. And we can have big loops of wire and we can use the loop, these loops of wire to create a magnetic field that traps the molecules in a little volume in 3D space. And they zoom around and the hottest ones can come up and over the edge of the magnetic field. We call that evaporation. So basically we, we, the atoms are zooming around, the most energetic ones escape the little magnetic bulb we're holding them in and the ones remaining have lower energy per particle, which is again, kind of like cooler, right? Lower energy per particle. And uh, so those two techniques, laser cooling and evaporative cooling are the, the basically how we got things very cold. Um, so what do you do in your, in the time free of work or what do you do in your free time? In other words, what are your hobbies from science? Uh, well, uh, I live, uh, if, we, if I were to go out or straight out that way onto the street and turn right, I live about four blocks from the mountains and I like to go running in the mountains. Uh, I run because of my missing arm, I run in this very sort of asymmetrical way. It's more like I go up, but I go up, up and down the trails with a couple, a couple other old guys several mornings a week. So that's one thing I like to do, go running in the mountains. Beautiful, beautiful and good exercise. Uh, I like to read. I read a lot. I read novels. Um, you know, it helps, helps with your creativity, I think, plus it's just fun. I work crossword puzzles. Uh, I, I like to play competitive bridge. Um, back when I was trying to uh, to uh, court my wife, trying to convince her that I was a real prospect, uh, she was a very good bridge player. And I realized that if I was gonna get anywhere, I had to step up my game. And so I did over time. Uh, and we sometimes, uh, not so recently, but we used to go out to, to the clubs, you know, uh, uh, where you compete against other people. Uh, and it's very, very intense and competitive and, and not, not fully fun, you know, in the way that some, some, some sort of intense competitions can be, but still exciting. Um, I'm still not as good a bridge player as she is, but she tolerates me because I've got other good features. Maybe. Uh, then the next question is, uh, what is your favorite math paradox and why? Favorite math paradox? Um, Well, my favorite, my favorite math proof is that there's an infinite number of primes. And there's um, my favorite math paradox. Um, I don't know if I have a favorite math paradox. I don't uh, Years ago, I taught a class called physics paradoxes. And they were the usual sort of paradoxes you hear about special relativity and things like that. That was a fun class to teach. Um, next question is, how, if at all, have you dealt with the disappointment of not getting the results you expected or having to change directions in your research? you ever find it frustrating that there are no guarantees in research? All the time. Yeah, it can be very frustrating. Um, especially in, in experimental physics, you know, you can, it could be, you can not see what you expect because your expectation is wrong. It could be because the experiment's broken, you know, and, and it's all, a lot of this stuff is homemade stuff, homemade electronics, homemade lasers. They could just be broken in ways you don't understand. And there's no repairman in the world who can come and fix it for you. Uh, and that can be very frustrating. And some experiments I've done I just have never worked. And eventually the, the funding agency has said, yeah, sorry, Eric, we gave you your shot. Now we're taking away your money. Don't bother us anymore. And that's happened to me several times. And it's definitely a, a bummer. Um, you know, you try and learn from those things. Um, and Try not, try not to make the same mistakes again. Uh, but uh, there are signs when things aren't don't working and you'll never know why they didn't work. You know, and that's, that can be very frustrating. It helps if you, I, mean, I find the sort of the, the act of doing experimental physics itself sort of enjoyable. Um, I like the little, the little puzzles that come up and trying to solve the little puzzles. Uh, and that takes the sting off. Like if everything is like, 
if all your eggs are in the basket of I want to have this amazing result that people will just love, and then you don't get it, that hurts. Hopefully, on your way there, you've done something which you, you know, you've learned a little something about, you've had some chance to think about some cool things, develop some interesting technology, maybe, um, build some interesting little widget. Um, so maybe the idea is just like, don't hope to get all of your your reward, your self-validation, whatever it is, the, the serotonin, whatever it is that makes your mind go bling, things are good. Don't, you know, don't put all your hope in getting that. Don't imagine that that's only gonna come from your experiment succeeding and people saying, hooray, you've done a wonderful experiment. That's a nice feeling, but it doesn't happen very often. And, and um, so you can't, you've got to be able to enjoy the journey. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, so we'll take uh, one more question, please. Um, geez, I'm trying to choose between these. I guess, um, I guess we can combine two of these. So, have you ever had a situation when you wanted to quit science, and how have you dealt with it? Slash, what is your biggest regret? Okay, well, I definitely have had occasions when I wanted to quit science. Um, I would say that uh, for me, the sort of low point of my career was like my first year or two as being as an assistant professor, it was very difficult. I was having to write grant proposals. I was having to teach much more than I was used to teaching. Uh, my, I was having to hire graduate students and which I was not something I particularly knew what to do. Everything was all suddenly on me. It was a lot of stress. I would say that the first couple of years of being an assistant professor were kind of unpleasant. And I thought about punting, yeah, for sure. Uh, you know, several people said, you know, Eric, you should tough it out. It's gonna be, it's gonna get better. And uh, things are, you know, you're making some progress. Uh, just, you know, give us a little more time. And that was good advice. Um, but I definitely thought about it. But, but also, I, yeah, so that's definitely the case. Um, it helps to have, you know, mentors. Of, I, I think I've always been, fortunate to have good mentors, you know, people who have cared about me and, and uh, wanted to see me do well um, and had good advice. And there's another question, biggest disappointment, was that, was that a question? Uh, or biggest regret. Biggest regret. Uh, uh, you know, there was a, uh, Carl and I took some data in the like late 1990s, uh, well, right around 2000 or something like that. This is not really like a bitter, oh, woe is me regret, but we saw something a little weird in the data and uh, it wasn't really where we're going and we just let it slide. And later it turned out that there was something, it was a big deal. Um, like we almost, if we had spent like, you know, another month looking at that, we would have discovered something that somebody else got to discover. Uh, and uh, so I was kind of sad about that. And I thought, geez, if I could go back in time, I'd say that little wiggle there is more important than you think. <laughs> uh, but you know, I don't, there's not a particular moral to the story. There's not a moral that says like, you need to stare at every single wiggle because most little wiggles are just little wiggles. You know, you, you can't, it's also, if you, if you just like say, oh, every, I got to like track down every loose thread, you end up just pulling on every loose thread until your, until your sweater unravels, you know? You have to keep in mind, it's like some uh, big picture also, balance the looking at the little threads with some big picture goal you've got. And I think by and large, I've done okay at that. Every once in a while I say, yeah, I could have made a different call there. Uh, but, um, you know, sometimes I've had students this is a different sort of failure. I've had students who I who came into the group and I thought they had like a lot of promise. They were smart and uh, and like you know it just didn't click for them. Like they would work on it for a little while and they would say like I, I want to I don't want to do this anymore, and they would leave. And it's not the end of the world. It's like okay they tried it for a couple of years and it didn't work out. That happens. But I also sort of thought like maybe I could have been a better advisor. Maybe I could have like made that experience more more fun, more rewarding or something like that, uh, figured out what it was that, what sort of roadblock it was that was <coughs> getting in their way. So that's happened and I've sometimes thought I could have been better. Okay, 
Well, Dr. Cornell, we certainly appreciate your time today. It's been very fun listening to you. Um, everybody, would you like to say thank you um, with a virtual or hand applause, please? And we'll tell you thank you from SSP for your time and expertise. We really appreciate it. And at this time, the participants are dismissed to head off to their learning blocks. So thank Hi, you. Everybody. Have thank a good morning. Thank, thank, thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate you giving me my, my student quote of the day. That's why I accidentally hit that recording button. I had written down something you said and then had put it right here on top of my laptop. And I happened to push down a little too hard where you said that the research was explicitly a social activity. I thought that was a great comment and certainly supports what's happening in SSP, you know, during the summer. Right. But I apologize for sticking it on my laptop. Too Not hard. At all. Not at all. <laughs> Uh, so didn't mean to interrupt I, you. I hope that they're having, I guess, of course, it's all covid -y, so they can't really have the, the full nerd camp experience of meeting other people who are interested in science. And, and by the way, I use nerd camp as like a really strong positive term. <laughs> I, I think we've got some pretty good nerd campuses going. So I, yeah, we do. We do. With that. They're, yeah, they're, they're nerding out all over. The, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they happen to be on Zoom, but I think... Yeah. They did last year too, and I think they're doing it again this year. They're having a, a great experience, we think. And but everything we can do it certainly adds adds yeah. a lot to it. So yeah, we really appreciate it. Yeah. So, well, I'm going to head out. We, I've got. Yeah. I've got well, a thank thing. you so much, Dr. Cornell. Thank you so much. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Right. So I'm just. Uh,